After I wrote my article series on medical training, Danny McClintock, a resident of Brigham and Women's Hospital where I'm a cardiologist, emailed me describing the cultural shift away from giving candid feedback to trainees. Danny sensed that attendings and residents feared being labeled mean or malignant, so tended to say things like, you're doing great, keep it up, which isn't really feedback at all. He contrasted his experience as a trainee with that of being an elite college athlete, where his growth depended not just upon having his weaknesses pointed out to him, but also upon becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable. When he graduated, he described the mindset being an athlete had fostered in him. Each day, he wrote, brought with it a challenge. The chance to be pushed to the limit mentally, physically, and emotionally. The chance to find my personal boundary and try to go a little further than the day before. To succeed where I had previously failed. And to find a way to thrive during times of discomfort or uncertainty. He anticipated that these lessons would stick with him forever, and so far, especially during residency, they have. I've also thought a lot about the parallels between thriving and growing as an athlete and thriving and growing as a trainee, partly in terms of recognizing weakness and learning from it, but also in terms of knowing our limits. I used to run competitively, and during my fourth year of medical school, planned to run the New York City Marathon. During training, my knees started to bother me. It began as a minor irritation, not unlike many I would dealt with previously, and always trained through. But then, as I pushed harder, it got worse, swelling and making it tough to stand on my remaining rotations. This is the part of the story where I should say I, of course, decided not to run the marathon. But that's not what happened. I ran it anyway, And though I almost quit somewhere in the middle of Brooklyn, the mantra of my high school coach echoed in my head. Pain is temporary, he would always say. Results are permanent. At so many meets, he had been right. Pushing harder made me better. But at the marathon, the opposite happened. I didn't run well, and I couldn't walk for six months after, recovering just in time to start internships. I wouldn't want to go through any of that again, but understanding this critical distinction between necessary discomfort and pathological pain is as important for training and practice as it is for any athletic endeavor. Making this distinction, though, has become much harder in the years since I trained. We are constantly told to take care of ourselves, that self-care is never selfish, that we must prioritize our own well-being and in some ways for good reason. The doctor heal thyself mantra looms large because historically, doctors did a really bad job at taking care of themselves, often at the expense of their families, their own health, and sometimes even their patients. Meanwhile, as we've discussed in the podcast, we're actively trying to end the stigma around mental illness and create more supportive and forgiving work environments. How can you possibly do that without telling people to take care of themselves? But, and this is the but that makes my stomach drop every time I say it, we are a profession that is supposed to be devoted to caring for others. So how do we distinguish the types of pain that need to be eliminated from the sorts of discomforts we must endure to be good at our jobs? Is self-care ever selfish? And why are these sorts of questions so difficult? to talk about. I'm Lisa Rosenbaum, and this is Not Otherwise Specified from the New England Journal of Medicine. In this episode, we'll have two guests, and they've both thought a lot about how to balance mental health and well-being with the rigors of medical training. We'll hear first from Leah Loggio, who's currently Vice Dean for Medical Education at Case Western Reserve University, where she's also a professor of medicine. She's had several educational leadership roles, including directing a residency program. She noted that the new emphasis on trainee well-being was welcome in many ways, but then she also described some of the challenges. The challenge is there is a direct tension between altruism, which is a tenet of medical professionalism, putting your patient's 
in front of yourself, in front of your own needs, with the commitment to self-care and your own wellness. And that's in direct conflict. And so what I've seen happen is that those both sides of that tension can be sort of weaponized, if you will, that, well, for my wellness, I can't do that for the patient, or you're talking about altruism because you're trying to get me to do more work. And I think that some of the complexities of this is that they are both noble goals. Altruism is really important and wellness and self-care are really important. So how do you choose when there's a direct um, tension between those two concepts? And the fact that wellness is so much more in the conversation than it used to be um, makes it that much more frequently brought up in terms of that tension that there's a lot of uh, confusion, there's even a little anger, there's even a little bristle to some of the things that, honestly, I took for granted when I was a medical student. And I'll, I'll go one more step, too, because now I'm in an undergraduate medical education system. Learning, if you've ever learned anything, a language, playing the piano, anything, it's uncomfortable. And I think the students say, oh, I'm uncomfortable, and they back away from it. I'm like, no, 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 lean into that, because there's a discomfort in learning. That's not anti-wellness. That's not anti-well-being. That's human. Like, be human. We definitely want doctors who are human. And I think that, you know, discomfort can also not be conflated with my well-being, or because it's it's not. It's learning. It's stretching. It's growing. It's what you want. Leah pointed out that every senior generation looks at the junior generation and critiques them. The same was true when she was a trainee. And I agree. There's no getting around the kids these days fallacy as we try to describe changing cultural norms. But even if few among us are capable of being unbiased observers, the culture still changes, and sometimes for the better. Here's Morgan Hennessy, an acute care trauma surgeon at Cedar sinai Medical Center, who finished her training last year. Of all the physicians on this season of NOS, Morgan spent the longest time in training, completing a PhD in the middle of medical school. This meant that she entered the clinical environment and then left for four years, which gave her a unique perspective on cultural shifts. So I started med my medical training in 2009, and so I arrived on campus early to start my PhD rotations. Um, and, you know, we went through the first two years of medical school. We actually did one medical rotation before we went off to the lab um, to complete our PhDs to sort of ground ourselves in some way in medicine to give us some perspective, which I really appreciated. Um, and then when I returned after four years in the lab and, and you know, came back to my medical training, it, it definitely, things were definitely in a state of change. Um, you know, I, I think that the talk around wellness, the talk around well-being, like none of that was there when I first started. And then when I came back, um, I was really sort of at the precipice of starting a big wellness culture change, especially in the Department of Surgery. Um, with our new chair and several people in the department really taking this on and, and hiring people specifically dedicated to um, pursuing these goals. So, you know, that combined with several people from the department being let go and, you know, these people, the malignant people that would yell at people or throw things in the operating room, um, there just became a zero tolerance policy for things like that, you know it just wasn't okay anymore. And do you remember how you perceived those changes? Did those feel good and right to you? Yeah, I mean, I, it felt like there was hope for, you know, a different future for us um, and that people gave time to, you know, think about how our lives all could be better and not just for the trainees, but also for the faculty themselves. And 
there's a trickle down effect. So if the people who are teaching us are well, then we can be more well and our patients can be more well. So it, it felt hopeful, especially as it comes from, you know, a young woman training in surgery. Um, you know, our program went from, you know, I think my year was the first year we were fully 50% women trainees in the program ever, which was a really exciting thing to be a part of. Um, and then the trend towards being more family friendly, really, um, you know, people began really growing their families during residency and being very supported by the faculty and by the program. And that was really beautiful to see as well. Despite these positive changes in the training environments, Morgan still grappled with some of the struggles that many trainees confront as they try to figure out what they want to do with their lives, especially as they try to separate what they want from what's expected of them. I, I really think that for me, coming to the realization that I would be living my own life and making my own choices and was the only one who could you know, really determine the outcome of my career, that was really the, the hard part. Um, I think as trainees, especially as like extreme type A high achieving trainees, we're conditioned to go to others for experience, who have more experience for advice to tell us what to do. And we're also trained to make those people happy because that's how we succeed in medical training and in academia is that you go to your mentor you say, how can I do better? And then you do those things. And, you know, the, this first started when I was a medical student and I said I wanted to be a surgeon. Um, that wasn't necessarily received particularly well by the MD-PhD program. And then when I landed in residency, I felt, you know, this is where I was meant to be. This is what I was born to do. But choosing the residency is only part of the battle. The second part came from, you know, fourth, fifth year what do I do my fellowship training in? Where do I go from here? And how do I live up to all these expectations that have been piling on me over the years? Because it has been a long time on the launch pad, so to speak. So when I was a fourth year resident, I had gone through some sort of changes in terms of what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be a surgical oncologist when I started my surgical training. Um, then I did some additional rotations. I said, you know, actually, I really want to do more general surgery. I wanted to be more of a generalist, and I loved pediatric surgery. So I said, pediatric surgery, that's the, that's the place for me. And we had some fantastic pediatric surgeons at Mass General who were incredible mentors to me, and I had a wonderful experience. Um, and so I started putting my whole application together. I worked really hard to do an elective at Boston Children's Hospital um, to get more experience. And sort of by the end of that winter, I came to the realization it just didn't feel right. And even though everyone around me supported me and was kind of like really excited about this path for me, and it fit together in many ways, you know, with my research interests, clinical interests, my technical abilities, things like this all coming together, it just didn't feel right to me. And it was like devastating because I had to disappoint all these people around me. But I had to save myself, right? You know, nobody else was going to go out and be a pediatric surgeon. It was going to be me. This is going to be my life. And um, I, I came to the realization at like age 30 that I had never really thought about that. You know, I had thought so much at each stage about how can I please those around me and how can I be the best? How can I be the most successful? How can I um, get all that extrinsic positive feedback? Um, but not so much about what is a happy life. What does that mean to me? How am I going to achieve that? And does that fit within the confines of this particular specialty that I'm choosing? And the answer for that specific pediatric surgery specialty was, was actually no for me. And um, then I was kind of in a position where I didn't know what I was gonna do after graduation. It was one year until I was leaving general surgery residency. As you say, I had trained for 15 years. And I felt really lost. I didn't really know what to do. Morgan's mentors turned out to be really supportive and on some level, she knew the pressure she felt was in her own mind. But the stressors still triggered a major depressive episode. Um, it, you know, affected me in a very deep way. And uh, it was an acute thing. There were a lot of changes happening. Um, and I really knew, I knew from my past experience that I needed more support than just my friends and my family. Um, I needed actual mental health support to get through this. Um, that was a tough time. But I was able to connect with 
really amazing resources and I found two human beings who were fantastic. Um, I worked with a therapist and a psychiatrist and um, it was also a lot of self-reflection. So I read a lot of books and, you know, a lot of this sounds kind of simple, but just sitting down and saying like, what do I love about surgery? And the answer to that question was, I love operating in the abdomen. I love taking care of really sick patients. I love uh, working in the hospital and I love working with residents. Um, those are the main things that I came down to. And, um, you know, I said all of those things can be found in a lot of specialties, but most so in the specialty of like the acute care trauma surgery population, you know, where you're really, truly a generalist. And I also had this pipe dream that I would be a general surgeon as well, you know, be able to do elective general surgery. And again, similarly to when I was going into surgery as an MD-PhD student, that was not received with great um, enthusiasm from many people. Um, I was told that I would be wasting my talents going into that field. Um, and, you know, many people were not supportive. Um, but I think the experience of going through all of this made me feel more, you know, self-confidence that I, I had to follow the path that I was on for myself. And that, again, these other people didn't have to live my life. Only I did. Given her own experience with mental illness, as well as her appreciation for the necessary rigors of surgical training, I asked Morgan how she thinks about the difference between mental health and well-being. When it comes to, you know, how do we make that distinction, um, you know, that's going to be a very personal thing. And I, I don't want to um, make light of anyone's experiences. Surgical training is hard. Surgical rotations as a medical student are very hard, and they might cause some of the acute re reactions that we identify as mental health issues in a very short time period. Um, you know, you can have acute stress reactions, and I'm, again, I'm not a psychiatrist, so, you know, I'm just speaking in generalities. Um, you know, you can have those reactions to particular traumatic experiences. But I think when you go into the phase of you're having trouble getting out of bed, you're crying every day, you don't want to eat, you're losing weight, you have, you know, it's like the DSM criteria, you derive no joy from the things that you usually derive joy from, and you find it hard to make it through your days. Those are, that's the time when things are, we really need to be recognized. And I think we're so good at masking them too. Like we're so good at kind of putting on a happy face at work. I think when I was going through this, nobody would have guessed how bad I felt on the inside. They just saw me at work and they said, well, she's doing her job. You know, Morgan's tough. She can get through anything. Um, but that wasn't the case, of course. Um, you know, I, this is also a very personal issue for me because I've lost friends to suicide. Um, you know, I lost a friend who I trained with through my MD-PhD program um, when I was a third year resident and it was, it was horrible. Um, I think we all know the statistics around physician suicide. Um, and, you know, and it makes sense really to me because we're seeing the most intimate and, you know, gruesome details of some of the worst times in people's lives you know, how can you, how can that not affect you? And then also working in such a stressful environment where the expectations are so high and the margins for error are so thin. Um, it, it's only natural that this would be a profession that would stress people to the core. And, you know, we deal with it, we all deal with it in different ways. Um, I think what we need though is, uh, is access and, um, access to resources that doesn't take, um, an extreme amount of effort to obtain because, a surgical resident does not have the time to make five phone calls um, during their work week. They just don't. They're working 80 to 100 hours a week. They're doing like notes and other things outside of work. They just don't have the time. So we need to make it as easy as sending one email, pushing one button, talking to one person to get them in line for whatever resources they may need. And it needs to happen quickly. It can't be, oh, you'll have an appointment in a month. It has to be prompt. And then on top of that, it has to be covered. It can't cost a tremendous amount of money. So um, that means that we have to make resources available to people who work outside of business hours because those might be the only times that trainees are going to be able to attend appointments. Um, and we have to be flexible with them and you know help get them coverage if they need that care, just like they would need to have care if they had to get an endoscopy or see you know an OB-GYN for their pregnancy. You know. 
it's the same thing. There's it just because, you know, now we're talking about psychology, psychiatry, doesn't mean that it's different from anything else. Um, and then finally, I think, again, we need to destigmatize it. So people need to be not penalized and not um, looked down upon for seeking those resources. So how many of those goals are we going to achieve in a short period of time? You know, maybe not all at once. A lot of this is going to take some time. Um, but I do think that training programs could do better to at least identify and connect trainees with the appropriate resources. There have been times in it, since I've been in attending that I've been really worried about certain trainees from a mental health standpoint and feeling very conflicted about how to help them. I think with mental illness, because it's so personal, a personal connection can often help. But I think that also raises this question that I always struggle with also is not wanting to be too invasive, like not wanting to bring up something when maybe I'm misperceived that there's a problem. Or if I suggest that they don't seem okay, will it be interpreted as a criticism of their work? And so I'm really curious how during your depression, um, you know, whether you had faculty members reach out to you or even friends in the program and and if there were times that that felt like effective or if there were ways that were clearly ineffective um i think we all need to be sensitive to you know the reality of the situation which is that you know we don't live in a stigma free world we don't live in a world where everyone's going to understand and accept um you know that this is something that just happens to humans just like i said just like you might have a um infection or a broken leg, you know, people get depression. Um, so, you know, I would say I agree with you when it comes to the personal um, nature of, you know, in terms of effectiveness and not being perceived in the wrong way. Um, but, you know, I also don't think people should be so scared to approach each other and ask each other how they're doing. Um, one of the things that I like to do is um, at the beginning of the rotation, especially if I know it's going to be a hard one, I really, I lay it out on the table and I say, hey guys, this is going to be a really hard rotation. You might start feeling really bad. I have felt really bad in your position before. I want you to know I'm a safe person to come to if you need anything or if you want to talk or if you need some time off to recover. Um, that's okay and you can come to me. So I think identifying yourself as a safe resource does a lot to lower the activation energy for somebody to come to you. And I've seen really great effects of that over the years. I've had people come to me just because they said, well, you know, you mentioned that one time that you had depression or you mentioned that one time that you had therapy. So I knew you would understand or I, I thought you would understand. Um, of course, the thing that we all worry about are the people that are suffering silently and we can't identify them. The silent suffering is what many of us fear. Leah, who spent eight years as an internal medicine residency program director, lost an intern to suicide in 2014. She talked about that horrible day and how she and her colleagues tried to support the trainees in the aftermath. It was quite devastating for all of us because in a residency program, you're like a family. You're with each other day in and day out. And um, it was really a devastating um, uh, situation. I, it's the tragedies on so many levels, right? The tragedy of the loss of life, the tragedy for not recognizing what could have, should have, would have been done to prevent this. And the fact that healthcare, which is the caring profession, um, has this problem and it has this problem. The day-to-day -day events are still incredibly fresh in my mind because I don't think I'll ever unsee and unhear and unfeel what happened that day. Um, we, uh, I had to phone the family, which was probably the worst thing I've ever had to do. And then within a half an hour, we pulled everybody off the wards and into a conference room. And we had psychiatrists come chaplains come um, the entire administration was there and I stood up and told them what happened and the three house officers who saw the individual last 
uh, broke down and uh, really didn't know what to think or say or do. Um, the person who died was a first year intern. So after the conversation, um, if you don't feel comfortable working, go home, take care of yourself. Here's the chaplains. Here's the psychiatrists. The three individuals who were the last to see the intern actually went into a separate room with a psychiatrist, sort of debrief and talk about it. How did they feel? What's going to help? What's going to, they all went home. I asked if there were any questions, what anybody needed, how could they do it. I asked the interns to stay behind. Um, and I literally, it was a tiered lecture hall, I can remember it. And I literally went in front of every single intern, looked them in the eye, said, look me in the eye, tell me you're okay. And I went to the next person, what can I do for you? Look me in the eye, tell me you're okay. Forty something interns later. And I needed to just have that sort of physical presence, touch, um, recognition, human to human, that we were going to be okay. And it took us, <clears throat> we had about a week or more, maybe 10 days, where we converted the uh, medical library to a griefing, grieving room. We had candles and we had cookies and we had chaplains and just support people. And we all took our vigil uh, assignments to be there. And whoever needed to just take a break, they took a break. Um, and uh, we just, you know, it was a space to go and just talk to somebody or be quiet or just take a break. Because you know how hospitals are. There's not that many quiet places. <laughs> so um, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to honor the individual who died. And uh, we um, created a pin that had a little cartoon dog on it with a red leash on it. And it said, walk the dog. And every we gave the pins out to everybody. And we explained to everybody that the pin is, if you need a break to get your head in the right place, just tell whoever you're around that you need to go walk the dog. And you have license to walk out of the hospital for 20 minutes, go walk the dog, whether you have a dog or not. And it was a strategy to make it okay and to give permission to pause. And lots of people walked the dog for a long time to just get some sky time outside of the hospital walls. I think we all fear trainee suicide and want to do everything we can to prevent it. And it's clear that being unwell, whether physically exhausted or under extreme emotional stress, can trigger mental illness among those who are predisposed. But part of what's made these conversations tough is that being mentally healthy doesn't necessarily mean the absence of distress or discomfort. And the person who's articulated this best, in my view, is the psychologist Lisa Damore. She focuses on adolescent mental health, but her conceptualizations are relevant to all of us. In an interview she did with the New York Times' as Ezra Klein, she discussed how psychological distress and mental health concerns get conflated. She said, quote, In fact, what I hope we can maybe move toward is an understanding that it's actually often the inverse, that much of the time the presence of distress, the experience of distress, is evidence of mental health. And what I mean by that is that there are lots of circumstances in daily life where we fully expect to see distress. And then she said, I think what I feel I'm working against, what my field is working against, is this strange equation that has evolved in the discourse where being mentally healthy is equated with feeling good or calm or relaxed. And those are all lovely things. 
But those are not how we as psychologists assess mental health. So given that important distinction and the known discomforts of training, I asked Morgan how she approaches this balance of rigor and well-being. When people tell me they want to become a surgeon, you know, I'm not trying to discourage anyone. But usually, and what most people will say is, are you like, did you try, did you think of everything else? Are you sure that this is the only thing that you could do that would make you happy? Because the reality is it requires significant sacrifice. It requires a significant toll on you physically, emotionally. Um, You know, every part of your life is going to suffer to some extent in order to be a surgeon. And that is not just only in training, but that's for the rest of your life. And that's because of the great responsibility that we carry into our patients, that somebody is going to trust us to take them to the operating room and to have their life in our hands, that we're going to be able to take care of them and that we're going to do it to the best of our ability. Um, and and that, is, that is just the way that it is. There's no way to make it easier than that, right? You can make the hours different. You can assign less patients to one particular person, but the responsibility isn't going to change, and the expectation of excellence isn't going to change. And I don't think people want surgeons who aren't dedicated to that excellence and that responsibility. There are some shared qualities and some shared, you know, perhaps priorities that certain people must have in order to do this career, to be a a surgeon. One of those things is being okay giving up some of your sleep because surgical training requires you to take call. And being able to operate under conditions of stress and conditions of sleep deprivation is the reality of being an attending surgeon. So whether or not you think that that's kind, it's the way that it is. There's certain things in surgery where we need to hold people to a very high standard and in training, that doesn't need to equate with being mean. That doesn't need to equate with making someone feel crappy or humiliating them in front of others. There are ways to promote excellence. There are ways to give feedback. There are ways to help someone learn or help them through a difficult situation without causing them shame and humiliation. Um, So I think those two things can stand together. Um, It might just take a little bit more Thoughtfulness. Morgan has brought some of that thoughtfulness to her own operating room as she begins her career as an attending. There is definitely a feeling in surgical training that one needs to be tough and unemotional and impenetrable as a surgeon. And I think that that's a falsehood. I think that the surgeons that are most effective are the ones that are in touch with their emotions the ones that understand what's going on in other people's heads, that can read people's emotions and understand where they're coming from, that are willing to relate to people on a personal and emotional level. Um, Those are the people who are going to be most effective, not the, you know, impenetrable, you know, stoic surgeon who comes into the room and never cracks a smile. Um, So I think it starts at the top. You have to set the tone. Um, You have to be the example that you want to set. Part of that means that you have to create an environment of safety for those people around you to speak up. You know, the people, the the units and the the teams that work the best, that are the most effective, um, that are the most robust, are the ones where people feel comfortable coming forward with problems. So you have to check your own ego and your own emotions to be able to set an environment where people can speak up. And that comes down to also, hey, you know, I'm not feeling well today, so is it okay if I go sit down for a minute? Or, hey, I'm really thirsty or I need to use the bathroom. Is it okay if I go use the bathroom? Like, it might sound very silly, but medical students probably don't feel comfortable speaking up saying they need to use the bathroom. So, again, that's where, like, the setting expectations part comes in. If I'm going into a a long operation and there's a medical student, I say, hey, if you need to use the bathroom, just leave. Nobody cares. If you need to get a snack, it's okay to leave. Um, if you, you know, need to sit down because you're feeling faint, just sit down. It doesn't matter. It's okay. It happens to all of us. Um, and, it, you know, it's not like me admitting that I'm weak. It's me just admitting that I'm human. And 
saying it's okay for you to be a human too. I, I think that expectation setting and setting the stage is really important. When it comes to um, on a larger level, well-being, um, you know, this is I think where people have been trying so many different programmatic things that have been more or less effective. And you know, the way I really think about it is that it's a zero-sum game when it comes to resources. So especially with surgical trainees, there's only a few of them per year. If one of them is out, then the others have to pick up the slack. And that's just the way that it is. You can't hire five NPs to do the job of a surgical resident. It's just not possible. So you have to create some sort of a system with that has some redundancy in it um, so that people who are on lighter rotations are able to cover for their colleagues if they need to. But that also has to happen in an environment where they know that if they need help, the others will step up for them too. And the environment that we're in right now where people are so burned out and people are so sort of just downtrodden, I think, and the setting of the staffing shortages and the pandemic and the increasing load of paperwork and all these different expectations and how tough training has become, I think people get really, um, you know, protective of their own time and their own resources and they're less willing to give. So we need to show them that it's okay to give, it's safe, and that you will receive when you need help too. Um, so you have to come to that from this, like, you know, the abundance mindset rather than the scarcity mindset and show them that, you know, if you give of yourself, then you will be rewarded. And I try to set that example again for my junior residents and my uh, team. If, I, if a junior resident wants to go scrub in on a case and, you know, they're covering the floor pager, I'll take the pager for them, you know, so that they can go for an hour. Um, if my resident needs to go to a doctor's appointment, I'll hold their page, you know, whatever. I, it's fine. You know, I'm not too proud to put in an order for coal waste. And I'm not saying that we have to take everything on to ourselves. But if we don't start making the change, like, no one will. So to some extent, it has to start somewhere. Morgan also tries to uphold the same standards outside the OR as she does inside. One of her own residents taught her to call it bedside homeostasis. The concept of bedside homeostasis, you know, we come in in the morning for rounds, especially as surgeons in the morning, we're rustling around, we're pulling the sheet up, we want to look at the abdomen, we want to look at the incisions, um, you know, we might move the patient around to look at different things on their body, we might move the table away, but you always want to leave the patient better than how you found them, so... You bring the table back, you pull their johnny down, you pull their blankets up, you make sure that they're comfortable, you make sure they have their call light in case they need their nurse, you make sure their table is close enough to them that they can reach their cell phone or their drink or whatever else, um, and you respect, again, you respect them as a human being, and uh, they're not just an object, right? Um, and all it takes is like 30 seconds on rounds to do those things, especially if you have a couple people in the group, you can do it at the same time. Um, but it promotes this sense of like humanizing the experience and also showing that, you know, the high and mighty, you know, attending surgeons, not above giving the patient a boost in bed. If they're like sinking down, that's not a nursing job. That's just a way to take care of a patient. When we talk about well-being, we often think about it in the context of sleeping, work-life balance, and time to do other things outside of medicine that we love in life. But Morgan also pointed out something I hadn't thought a lot about, which is the important relationship between well-being and mastery. I think I, I credit my, my surgical training with making me dedicated to that excellence in and out of the operating room. Every small thing counts, um, you know, everything down to the, to the dressing. You know, my, my residents will definitely tell you I'm a little bit obsessive when it comes to that, even that kind of small stuff. But I think it matters. And I think that we owe it to our trainees to hold them to that standard so that they can be the best surgeons that they're able to be. And, and ultimately, that's going to be what's going to make them most well. Because if you're not a well-trained surgeon and you're, you know, taking a job, that's going to be really difficult for you because you're not going to be confident in your own abilities. So we owe it to people now to hold them to high standards and to promote excellence so that they can be well in the future also. It might be a little bit of short-term pain for the long-term gain in a way. It's mastery of a vocation. You know, I would hope, I would hope that most people who become surgeons feel like that's their life's purpose um, and that they're dedicated to excellence in that. But that's what we're wired to do as human beings is to, you need to have a purpose in life. And if you're not waking up every day with some 
idea in your mind that like all the pain and suffering that you're going through to become a surgeon is for some greater purpose and that you're achieving that. Um, if you're waking up every day and you're feeling like you're falling short, that's a recipe for mental, Ill- you know, at least not mental well-being, if not mental illness, right? Morgan's comment about how we owe it to trainees to hold them to high standards, but that we must do it kindly, made me think again about athletic performance and whether some of what makes for good coaching in sports can be applied to medical training. Danny, the trainee who emailed me, recalled two seminal moments in his own athletic career that highlight the right and wrong approaches. In the first, Danny was trying out for an international tournament at a four-day camp attended by 14 players vying for 13 spots. He played horribly, and at the end of the last day, the coach announced in front of all the players that everyone had made the team except him and that his plane ticket to the tournament had been changed so someone else could go. As Danny told me, that public shaming was an unnecessary discomfort. Then Danny described his college coach. After Danny's worst performance in a season-ending elimination game, the coach met with him several times to try to better understand why he had choked during the biggest moment of the season. These conversations were unbelievably challenging for Danny. They forced him to admit to himself what he had cost the team and to acknowledge that he wasn't the player he wanted to be. But then his coach told him he was going to push him harder than he'd ever been pushed because he believed in Danny, he cared about him, and he wanted him to be as prepared as possible for the highest pressure moments in the upcoming season. Danny went on to have the best game of his life in the NCAA championship match. The team won, and Danny was named finals MVP. Suffice it to say, Danny sees this as a necessary discomfort, the kind that truly changed him as an athlete then, but also now as a doctor. I'm Lisa Rosenbaum, and this is Not Otherwise Specified from the New England Journal of Medicine. If the pursuit of mastery requires hard work and having people who believe in you, it also requires that you believe that all that hard work serves some greater purpose. That belief, though, a belief that for so long justified the many sacrifices trainees make, seems to be crumbling. Next up on Not Otherwise Specified, we'll be talking about moral injury among clinicians and trainees and how medicine's many corporate constraints may prevent all of us from being the doctors we want to be. You have uh, practices that are being bought up by private equity firms. And once they buy them up, uh, they squeeze the doctors in all kinds of ways, uh, replacing physicians with um, you know, physician assistants or other people who are less expensive to hire pushing doctors to work faster to improve their efficiency, their, their door-to-patient time. Um, and, and to hear physicians talk about this, I was really jarred because it's the kind of thing I expected to hear from you know, people working at Amazon in, in a warehouse or um, maybe from Starbucks workers, um, but not from you know, these sort of prestigious professionals who have graduated from medical school and uh, are thought to be so autonomous. I'm Lisa Rosenbaum, and this is Not Otherwise Specified from the New England Journal of Medicine. I'd like to thank our editor, Deborah Molina, our senior producer, Mary Rose Madden, music by Blue Dot Sessions. We also get invaluable feedback from our team, Ginevra Pittman, Julie Barzillet, Sue Ellen Lee, and Abigail Schubach. Thanks for listening. Until next week.